Good morning and welcome everyone. Let's uh, just pray and then we'll get into our time of uh, discussions and see what questions are there today and uh, how we can uh, engage and interact. All right, let's uh, pray together. Um, John, would you like to please open in prayer? Yes, Pastor. Father, we honor you. We thank you for this morning. Even as we come together to discuss and un understand the scripture and also certain practical aspects, Lord, we pray that you will lead us. You will continue to speak to us, God. Give us wisdom and understanding. And we pray that every one of us will be enriched by your word, oh God. We submit ourselves before your presence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. Uh, welcome, everyone. So time is open um, for um, questions, answers, uh, discussions, anything that um, anyone would like. And uh, I don't know who should lead today. Um, Roshan, would you like to lead? I think uh, last, son last time was Jean, right? I think Jean led last time. Or Paul. Oh, Paul led last time, I think. Yeah, so Roshan, would you like to host today or? Sure, yeah, I'll do it. <laughs> we'll all be there, don't worry. <laughs> but yeah, you just take okay. it forward. Sure, Pastor, yes. Okay, okay. Uh, right, so we have a question from uh, John in the chat section. So he's mentioned, uh, talking about the fivefold ministry in Ephesians 4, uh, the previous verses talks about Christ descending to the lower parts of the earth and then ascending far above all heavens and giving the gifts. Could you explain the connection with this to the fivefold ministry? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, is, does anybody have yeah. any insight on that, please? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, so uh, if you just look at the flow of thought there in Ephesians chapter 4, uh, <clears throat> in uh, verse 1 to Paul is just telling us, you know, that uh, uh, each one should be faithful uh, and uh, that we are stewards with what God has given to us. And um, each one should be faithful, uh, with, you know, with what God has given to us. Then uh, he tells us to... Yeah, that's that was verse one, and then he tells us to you know walk in the unity of the spirit. He talks about the fact verse four, there's one Lord, one God, one faith, and then verse seven he starts talking about gifts, right? So verse seven he says you know to each one is given gifts, and then suddenly he kind of seems like he diverges off uh, into you know, a, a, a picture. He's actually drawing from uh, the Old Testament, uh, from, I think, Psalm 68. Yeah, Psalm 68. So he's actually drawing from the Old Testament. This is quoting from the Old Testament. So it's actually a fulfillment of um, Bible prophecy. Uh, so he's, he's, he's going off into a, a picture, which actually is scripture, Psalm 68, which he quotes here. And then he comes back in verse uh, uh verse 11, to continue with the thought on gifts, right? So if you see verse 7, he's talking about gifts. Verse 11, he's talking about gifts. Uh, 8, 9, 10, he's, he's, he's painting a picture for us. What is this picture? This picture is of, uh, uh, you know, of Christ who, um, who um, he descended. That means he died. He went down to the lower parts of the earth. He ascended so that when he ascended, he took captivity captive. So he, you know, he released all the Old Testament saints uh, who were held in Abraham's bosom up until that time. So the Old Testament saints who died, they didn't go to heaven. They went to paradise. Parada paradise was at that time in Abraham's bosom in the lower parts of the earth. So when you come into the New Testament, paradise is always in heaven. In the Old Testament, paradise is Abraham's bosom in the lower parts of the earth. So when Christ died, he descended, he set this captives free, and then he's ascending in a triumphant procession. That's the picture Paul is painting for us. Uh, 
which is of course from the Old Testament scripture. But now it's like, you know, a, a king who is victorious and he's leading his army, his, uh, his army in a triumphant procession ascending. And you find this also in, uh, in other parts of Paul's writing. So when you look at Colossians chapter 2, verse 14 and 15, Paul is using that same image, you know, that same triumphant procession image of uh, Jesus being the, uh, the champion, the conqueror, and leading uh, in triumphant procession. So part of the triumphant procession had to do with shaming the enemy. So that's where he's talking about Colossians 2, 14, 15. He put the enemy, Satan, to public shame, public display. But part of the triumphant procession is also honoring the people, uh, like uh, the, the, the king's champions, honoring them, giving them, you know, medals and awards. So he's drawing that picture for us. And then he comes back to the holy thing of giving gifts to men. So uh, uh, if, uh, verse 7 says he's given gifts to all, all, you know, now, according to the measure of Christ. So each one is given, you know, grace. According to, so that's every believer has received gifts. Then he goes off onto this triumphant procession picture, quoting from Psalm 68, Jesus, you know, descending and ascending and leading uh, the procession of victorious people. Uh, and then he says he also gave special gifts. That's verse uh, 11. And these are, you know, apostles, prophets, past teachers. So it, it's a really beautiful picture that he's painting between verse 7 and uh, 11. Is that okay, sir? Uh, yes, Pastor. Uh, just a follow-up question to that. So as you said, um, so Jesus took everyone from Abraham's bosom and took them to the um, heaven. So it, does Abraham's bosom exist now or where does believers in Christ go after they die? Mm. So um, Abraham's bosom, which is paradise, is now in heaven. So when you, especially when you come to the New, uh, New Testament, uh, in 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 Second Corinthians, uh, chapter twelve, Paul says, "I was caught up into paradise, so up in the third heavens." So Abraham's bosom exists today, but not in the lower parts of the earth, but it exists in heaven. So it's no longer called Abraham's bosom; it's called paradise. So it is in heaven. Um, uh, so you also find that in Revelation, where it talks about you know uh, you will uh, uh, you know. Uh, I forget the reference here. I think it's in chapter 3. talks about uh, being in paradise. So the word paradise in the New Testament always refers to heaven. And then, of course, today when a believer dies, his spirit goes straight to be with Jesus. Right? Uh, Philippians 1, um, Paul says, uh, uh, for me to, you know, to be, uh, um, in Philippians 1, he says, it is for, better for me to die and to be with the Lord. So Philippians 1. He's going to if he if he dies he's going to be with the Lord. Second Corinthians five to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So today when a believer dies immediately his spirit goes to be with Jesus. First Thessalonians chapter four Paul is writing those who sleep in Christ the Lord will bring with him. So that means those who die today have gone to be with Jesus the spirits and when he comes. Jesus brings them back with him so that their spirits can be reunited to their physical bodies. So today, immediately, the moment a person, believer dies, his spirit goes to be with Jesus. Thank you, Master. Okay. Okay. Back to Roshan. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. I guess, uh, do we have uh, any other questions? Uh, please share it in the chat section. Uh, good morning to you all. Um, I have one question, like uh, it's from John chapter 3, verse 8. It says that the wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Like, I'm a bit confused. Uh, I mean, like, can you kind of explain why Jesus is comparing the wind to the uh, like Holy Spirit, like yeah, that's the question. 
Hey, thank you, Salatoni. So just to reconfirm, so your question is, why is Jesus referring the wind to the Holy Spirit? Is that right? Yes, Pastor. Okay. And can the scripture that you mentioned is from John chapter 3, verse 8. Um, yeah, it says, so the wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Thank you, Zalatoli. Um, so, uh, would uh, Pastor Nancy, would you like to uh, share your thoughts on that, please? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Pastor Roshan. Uh, yeah, so Zalatoli, um, in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew, uh, the word, uh, the word, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, for spirit is ruah, okay, and uh, that is uh, sort of the same word for wind. So uh, that's uh, my opinion. Like uh, because of that, here the Holy Spirit uh, and the work of the Holy Spirit is compared to that of uh, uh, the wind, uh, and similar to uh, the work of the wind. Like you can't see it, but you can see the effects of the wind. And in the same manner, the Holy Spirit, like when a person is born again, it's the work of the Spirit. Um, you know that that is done for a believer to be born again. Uh, like you can't see it like in the in the physical realm the spirit um, doing that but then you see the effects of it you know the the person becomes a new creation um, and the life of god you know begins to flow through that person so um, uh, uh, that would be uh, the reason why jesus compared uh, the wind to the holy spirit and the work of the holy spirit so yeah i think uh, others could uh, probably add to that thank you Thank you, Pastor Nancy. Uh, okay. Okay. Anybody else? So feel free to uh, add in. Uh, Pastor, sorry, just want to check with Zelly Toli whether it uh, it makes sense. Uh, is that okay? Yes, ma'am. It's clear. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Nancy. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, please feel free to uh, add your questions in the chat section or uh, raise your hand and ask a question. Um, okay, uh, this is not exactly a, yeah, it's a question, I, I guess. Uh, we, um, in in biblical preaching class, we had this, uh, I, I think right at the first class, uh, when we were talking about hermeneutics, um, you know, we uh, this topic of um, polygamy was mentioned there, you know, in the notes. So then there was a question from the students about, um, you know, if in, in certain cultures today, you know, that is still practiced. And so... If a person who has multiple, you know, spouses, and um, uh, um, I, I typically talking about a man who has uh, maybe two or three wives, and then uh, the person becomes a believer, you know, and uh, the reality of uh, that happening in certain cultures. So, um, so would um, that person be allowed to serve in church? And if so, you know how? You know that was the question. So we were just kind of um, we. We parked that question. We were kind of saying, "Okay, I'll come back. We'll talk about it." And um, so, yeah, I just wanted to ask uh, Pastor. Um, yeah, yeah, we know that um, uh, you know the, the the spiritual side of it, and we know that we need to enforce that. Okay, it's it's one person, you know, one one spouse. Um, but the practical reality of working that out, especially in certain cultures, you know, maybe it's a like a tribal culture and kind of thing. How do we practically, uh, you know, work that out? Church leadership, uh, serving, and all that. So, yeah, I just wanted to check. Mm. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, this is this is uh, you know it is uh, a you know genuine situation we find uh, in, in various 
cultures. Um, so at least, again, there, there is no biblical instruction on you know how to go about something like this. So um, where the Bible is silent, we, we should make uh, you know, our uh, decisions by the wisdom of God while align, aligning to the rest of scripture. So the Bible doesn't you know, uh, address such a specific situation. So a man is already married, maybe he has two or three wives. Now he, he becomes a believer. Maybe his whole family becomes a believer, you know, becomes <clears throat> believers, which is very possible. Uh, you know, what do we do? And maybe he's zealous for God. Uh, that is uh, where, you know, of course, we don't want to uh, 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 disrupt things because you know uh, the people who uh, the families so let's say yes is the example let's say he has three wives and children from three wives now they're all are uh, dependent on him as husband and father so i think uh, we i mean we just have to apply the wisdom of god in a situation like that so now uh, we would uh, clearly explain I mean, to the congregation, to that culture that, look, this is what the Bible teaches. We are not um, compromising on the word of God. But this is a practical situation where uh, three, you know, about three families, because each wife and children are all connected because of this one man. And all of this happened before they got saved. So we can't disrupt that. These are real people, real lives, real household, real families. So at, at the same time, we're not going to prevent that person from serving God, honoring God. So, uh, uh, you know, we would take one of two approaches. One is leave the families. I mean, let's say they're all fine together, you know, and all of them. Leave them as it is. But we state the truth to everybody and say that, you know, we're not encouraging polygamy, but this is an already in pre-existing, like we say, a pre-existing condition. And we let that person serve in whatever way possible. And if God anoints and calls that person to be, you know, whatever, then we honor the anointing of God, you know, and, and, and because God is gracious. So we honor the anointing of God. We recognize whatever God is doing and go on. Now, there can be other situations. For instance, one situation we personally encountered when we were, this time we were in the US and we had gone to minister in Ecuador in South America and a man in a service, a man came up to me and then he confessed. He said, um, um, and of course it was all in Spanish through the interpreter and he confessed saying, you know, I, I am married, I have a family here, but without the knowledge of this family, I also, uh, you know, got married to somebody else there and I have another family in that place, what should I do? So this was a kind of a different situation where it wasn't like, you know, they were all living happily together, uh, but uh, he, he actually did something wrong, but he has two families, he's responsible for two families. So then uh, this in this situation, the second case that I just mentioned, uh, the answer is very clear, you know, you have to stay with one family uh, and the, what, the second family, the second person you got married, and um, you know you, you know you did this. You cannot continue there. You have to stay with your, you know, the first wife. But you have a moral responsibility to take care of that family financially. So you know you just can't abandon and walk away, right? Uh, so uh, so in that situation, what I did tell him was, you have to stay with one family but fulfill your financial responsibility there because you know you were part of the cause for that family to come into existence so you know we deal with that situation a little differently whereas in the first scenario where we saw if you know if it was families are living happily then you don't want to break things down uh, you know, unless that man is willing to make saying, okay, this lady was my first wife, so I'm going to keep that family. Uh, the second and third wife, you know, maybe I keep them separately, but he has to continue to fulfill his financial obligation. So from a practical standpoint, he has one wife, children, but 
from a moral standpoint, he is taking care of his second wife and third wife in those families. So, you know, uh, it may be just a physical rearrangement of situations, but uh, in reality, he's taking care of three families. Um, and, you know, so we could have these options. But I think ultimately, uh, it's the grace of God. It's, we look at it from the perspective of God's grace and God's mercy uh, without hurting people, without destroying lives. Uh, that's what I would I would put forward uh, you know, in response to that. Yeah. Great, Master. Thank you. Yeah, um, I think it's it's yeah, it's it's not a it's, it's it's kind of a complex situation, right? Practically applying, and I guess some sacrifices also, uh, yeah, uh, have to be made, and it's some tough uh, things. Yes, yeah, I understand that. Thank you. <clears throat> hey, Roshan, back to you. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Master. Uh, yes. So uh, Divya has asked us a question so from James chapter four, verse seven. Um, which says, submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Uh, when it says in the scriptures to submit to God and resist the devil, uh, how this is done in a believer's life at an application level effectively. Okay, um, so just again to give us the context from the scriptures from James chapter 4, uh, if I have to read from verse 6 and 7, it says, But he gives us more grace. Uh, this is what the scripture says. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Uh, he's actually quoting there from Proverbs 3.34. Uh, he opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Um, submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Uh, Divya, is it okay if I just read a couple more scriptures before prior, like verse 4 and 5, just to understand better? Okay. Yeah, okay. So it says, uh, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred towards God? Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think scripture says without reason that the spirit he caused to live in us envies intense, intensely? But he gives us more grace. This is why scripture says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves then unto God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Uh, I'll, I'll sh share my thoughts and I'll open it up for uh, other faculty to share their insights on it. Uh, but I, I feel like what James is, James, I mean, obviously knows his audience uh, when he's writing this. Um, and I feel like, you know, the Although these, there is this group of people who call themselves believers, uh, you know, they yet desire uh, of the things of the world, uh, the pleasures of the world, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, which uh, I think, in I, I mean, back in those days, uh, if I understand things very clearly, so in, there was a lot of influence of the Greek civilization, which was all about their personal desires. Uh, there, you can do what you want, as uh, you know, if you have the desire, kind of a thing. Um, but that, and that's what the scripture says: that God opposes that you can't serve two masters, uh, so to speak. And 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 then it comes down to verse seven, which says, um, "Submit yourself. Um, su submit submission." Uh, is just an alternate word for uh, humbling ourselves, giving our all. Uh, it's a sign of humility. I think that's why the previous verse says, he opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. And uh, and I've actually, I mean, I've been reading this book called Absolute Surrender by Andrew Murray. He, uh, it's, he touches on the same subject where he says, uh, submitting yourself has everything to do with humility and um and independence is kind of the source of pride that saying that okay i i'm independent i don't need god for you know for him to give me my desires i can help myself but uh, i think what the scripture says is you know when we trust him when we solely depend uh for uh you know from our day day to day basis um uh, you know it, it pleases it pleases him so um I think a uh, life application on a regular basis, uh, uh, we go to him, we look to him for everything, for all our wants and all our needs. Uh, and, and, you know, 
and just having that uh, attitude in our hearts where uh, I can't do this on my own without you. And that somehow pleases him. Uh, so that's my insight. That's my thought. Uh, and uh, if there's anybody uh, from the faculty who would like to add to that, please feel free to. Um, I was thinking, um, when we say submit to God, we are also uh, submitting ourselves to the authority of uh, his word, like the precepts and principles and um, instructions um, that the Lord has laid out. So we are bringing ourselves, aligning ourselves to his word. So, um, you know, whatever instructions are there, whatever principles are there, we are bringing ourselves um, before uh, and uh, submitting ourselves to his authority. So when we do that, when we are not, uh, you know, when we when we are intentionally not stepping out of that, but when we are intentionally aligning ourselves to the Word of God, to His instructions, um, then we are, uh, you know, daily when we do that, we are actually submitting to God, and then with that comes the authority to resist the work of the enemy. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, also, yeah. Sorry, Nancy, go ahead. I know it's okay, Jean, you go first. Okay, uh, I think one of the um, practical ways of, uh, is, is also, you know, what we see in Ephesians 6, 11, um, you know, a verse that's so familiar to all of us, putting on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the vials of the evil one. And uh, that entire portion talks about um, the armor of God and what you can do to withstand the evil one, so that we stand. Uh, uh, I think that's very familiar. Uh, and also verse 18, in addition to the armor of God, it says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. So um, putting on the armor as well as praying with all prayer and supplication in the spirit so that we are being watchful till the end to resist the work of the enemy. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jean, Pastor Jakes, and uh, Pastor Ocean. Uh, just to add to the line of thought here, uh, while we're talking about submitting to God, uh, and then, you know, James says, resist the devil. So I was reminded that uh, in order for us to resist the devil effectively, uh, we have to walk in alignment to uh, God's God's will, God's plan, God's purposes. And as Pastor Jai Kumar said, uh, uh, in line with his word, his precepts, his principles. So once we have done that, um, uh, I was reminded of uh, Ephesians 4.27. Uh, and that uh, scripture says, uh, nor give place to the devil. So once we have submitted ourselves to God, that's when we're in a good position. Uh, we, we are in a place where uh, uh, give no place to the devil also means, you know, give the devil no opportunity. Don't give him any loophole. Uh, let there be no cracks. So you, you, we are in a safe position position um, even if the enemy uh, were to do something against us you know we are fully submitted to God and uh, we are able to uh, resist the devil we are able to uh, gain victory over the enemy so yeah just this additional thought about uh, giving no place to the devil thank you thank you uh, Pastor Jake's Jane and uh, Pastor Nancy thank you okay um, all right, so the next question we have from is from Diana, Diana Thurur. Um, there are many translations of the Bible. One, why was, is there a need for this? Two, uh, what is the best way to explain this when asked by a non-Christian? Okay. Thank you, Diana. Um, so just to understand the question uh, better, so uh, when you say, why are there many translations as in, uh, are you, are you referring to the uh, the versions or is it the languages the trans why is the bible translated into so many different languages uh, uh, probably the versions i didn't oh. know what the right was, word was to say translation or version oh, sure sure probably no the problem. version okay what okay. my ignorance <laughs> sure sure no problem okay yeah 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 so just a quick uh, quick uh, uh, note there on, on that. So, um, I, um, you know, 
just to understand how Bible translation uh, is done, uh, which gives us, you know, a wide range of versions. Uh, uh, so very, very, you know, I just put it in a very concise way. Uh, there is, um, there is uh, two two main criteria. One is structural integrity, on one side, and then there is uh, audience relevance. So um, when Bible translators are, you know, working on the translations, they're saying, "We want to be struck. Uh, we want to, do we want to maintain structural integrity, meaning word for word translation, or do we want to be relevant?" To our audience that means you know i'm going to say what that verse is saying in a way that's very relevant to the modern day that's relevance and then there is uh, uh, the integrity of meaning that means uh, while uh, they, they're not so particular on word for word they want to maintain meaning right the meaning has to be correct so there are these three big criteria, right? So, so you, we will have some versions that are word for word translations, like the King James uh, and, and you know, many others, new King James, the new King James, uh, they are word for word, you know? Uh, uh, so if that word is there, that word will be, you know, in corresponding English word or words will be used. So they are maintaining that kind of an integrity. Then there is, uh, in, you know, maintaining thought and meaning. What was the thought? What was the meaning that was conveyed? So you have Bibles that focus on that. So, you know, um, uh, uh, NIV and uh, uh, New American Standard Bible and uh, the Passion Translation. And they all try to do that. They are kind of, you know, uh, a thought for thought, meaning for meaning, you know. They, they're not word for word, but they're trying to capture the meaning. And at the same time, they're trying to keep it in modern language, you know, uh, in, in today's language. And then you have Bibles that are just purely, okay, we want to be relevant to the modern audience. We're not worried about word for word. Uh, we are not so, uh, uh, I mean, the meaning is important, but we want to put it in modern language. So we want to convey the thought in modern language. So you have modern translations like the, you know, we would put uh, the Living Bible, the uh, Message Bible, uh, those kinds of versions, which are, they're, they're not word for word, they're not, you know, um, thought for thought, but they are more, let's be relevant to today's uh, audience. So they're on that extreme. So that's the reason why you have these white. They're, 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 you know, they're serving a different kind of audience uh, in, in, in the whole process of uh, translation. So sometimes you read the Message Bible and it's like, whoa, you know, uh, this seems so far from, uh, you know, the King James, what the King James says, because they've just used totally different words. And uh, uh, it almost is like um, it's not in the original text but the, the intent is different the intent is so the living bible is a paraphrased version so not even a translation it's a paraphrase um, uh, the message bible is you know just being relevant to today's world so you have this wide range uh, it all depends on what the translators were trying to achieve so that's the reason and you can explain it because you know uh, different people uh, can relate to different things there are people who relate very well to the message Bible or the living Bible, you know, because they just want something that's not heavy, but at least something that gives them an essence. Then there are those who uh, who want to study the Bible. So they will go for the word for word translation. They may even look up the Hebrew and the Greek because they want to study. And then there are those who want to get the meaning or the thought. And so they may, you know, go with the, uh, you know, some of the, say the Amplified Passion Translation, NASB, things, things like that. So, uh, so that's the whole reason. Uh, 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 and uh, for a person who wants to study the Bible, they better off to go to something that's very close to the original. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I guess if you can put this uh, to uh, you know to a non-Christian in a very simple way, saying, look, uh, you know, just like you know, uh, 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 you know. 
a topic in science uh, for a for a, a for kids in second or third grade that same topic is put down put in a very simple way like right? it may not have all the details but you give an essence of that principle in a very simple way those who come to you know sixth and eighth grade they get into a little bit more details the same topic those who are in 12th grade same topic more detail and those who are in university same topic and those who are doing research same talk but each in you know so much uh, greater detail and that's that's the difference yeah. thank you pastor um, i just have a quick follow on question uh, pastor so when a non christian comes we are in the process of talking to somebody when the non christian comes uh, which version uh, of the bible can we primarily rec recommend them to read first time mm -hmm. um if they if their english is good you know fairly decent uh, i would say we could you know start them off with the new king james uh simply because uh, uh it is close to the original and yet it is you know in plain english which doesn't have the thou's and the these and uh, all that uh, um uh, or if that is not so you know maybe in an iv or something that the, that the problem if we start them off in something or in a, a new american standard bible uh, so i would say uh, uh, new king james or the new american standard bible uh, if their english is not that great okay maybe an iv if it's really not that great then okay you know you go to something very simple the problem getting them started with uh, say like a you know a living bible or a message bible is then there has to be a lot of learning and maybe even unlearning that has to happen if at some point they you know move to bible study uh, then they'd be wondering like you know hey i read something in message bible that actually said something totally different uh, so they have to unlearn that and then you know pick up so i would say that you know if their english is decent start with you know new king james and new american standard bible uh, only if their english is very poor then you don't know, uh, give them something simple uh, yeah thank you pastor it's helpful yeah. thank you pastor thank you diana um uh, we have another question from Zella Doli. I think it's quite an important one. Uh, she says, what's the biblical way of uh, disciplining someone who has already started to live in with his or her partner be before holy marriage? Uh, because I grew up in a Baptist church and I noticed the pastor used to call their names out in front of all the church members that he, she, a name has been cut off from membership because they committed a for, a fornication, adultery, etc. Um, so, what's the biblical way of disciplining um, an individual or a couple uh, that, that who've been living together? And, um, so, yes, Jean, would you like to share your thoughts on this? Uh, yeah. Um, thanks, Roshan. So I, um, okay, so I'll, I'll probably just share a couple of uh, insights and then um, yeah, leave it to the rest. So uh, I think the first and foremost thing is maybe to be able to arrange a private meeting with the offender um, so that it is, um, uh, you know, it can be done in love, they can be admonished and also, um, you know, also discussed and and spoken because whatever we we do needs to be done in love. And even scripture says, when when your brother sins um, against you, tell him his fault uh, uh, between you and him alone. So if if so so that's I think the first thing that uh, that would be the most practical thing. If that fails, it's then to be able to bring it to uh, several witnesses. So that again, in scripture, it talks of uh, how you know two or three witnesses, every word needs to be established. So bringing it before witnesses, um, maybe then again, it is to then admonish and warn. Um, I, I think it's the final resort where the matter needs to be brought up to the 
uh, entire church. Um, so the scripture is seen in Matthew 18, where it talks about the offended brother. And it says in 15, that's what I said, 15 is where you arrange like a private uh, meeting. 16, which it says is bringing out witnesses. And 17 uh, verse, it says, if he refuses to hear, tell it to the church, but he refuses even to hear the church, let him be in you like a heathen and a tax collector. So, uh, so if we were to look at it collectively, it would probably need to follow um, you know, a, a private meeting followed by certain witnesses being and then being admonished and then maybe bringing the matter to I don't know, whole church, probably to the to a leadership um, on what the next action could be. Yes, Roshan. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you, Jane. Thank you. Uh, is, and would anybody else like to add, share some thoughts on that? How would you go about handling a situation like that and you know, disciplining it? couple or individual. Pastor Paul, would you like to share your thoughts on that? Uh, yes, I'll just probably give one point. Thank you, uh, Roshan. Uh, just uh, as I was just uh, you know, thinking about this, I, a verse came to my mind, 2 Timothy 3.16. Uh, it says that all scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. So uh, I think the first thing that we can do is bring out scripture um, uh, as to why it is uh, you know, uh, uh, important to live holy lives and uh, 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 you know, focusing on the word uh, while, while also giving them the practical reasons as to why it's not right to uh, you know, uh, uh, have a live-in relationship but when we bring out the scriptures um uh, the scripture is god breathed and it uh, you know it, it gives us an opportunity to uh, you know to bring correction in the right way uh, because at times i i feel that you know uh, maybe they are already decided and they've uh, you know this relationship has maybe uh, uh, you know it's gone on for a long time and uh, sometimes uh, you know uh, uh, practical um you know advice will help yes definitely uh, but uh, when we uh, you know uh, rely on the scriptures and, and and give them scriptures as it says in second timothy 3 16 it uh, uh, the the word of god that is that has power to bring correction and training for righteousness so uh, uh, so in the spiritual aspect even as we uh, do the practical things the spiritual is um, uh, firstly, this uh, give them a teaching uh, on the word of God as to why uh, live-in relationship is wrong and uh, what are the effects in, of uh, you know a live-in relationship over the body or the mind, uh, and so hopefully uh, and along with that also the practical aspects as uh, Jeet mentioned uh, uh, to be taught to them as well. So that's just one thing. Thank you, Pastor Roshan. Thank you, Pastor Paul. Uh, thank you, Jean. Um, Zilatoli, I hope that answers your question. Do you have a follow-up? Uh... Uh, yes, thank you, Pastors. Uh, I got a much deeper insight in this. And like, uh, after they repent, is it necessary the pastor need to call out their name that they have repent and their membership, uh, they are now, again, their name has been, uh, you know, enrolled in the church, something like that. Is it necessary to tell the whole church congregation because I noticed while growing up, you know, the person who have committed, they used, they used to cut their names out and after some period of time, you know, again, they used, the pastors used to call up their name and the people who, you know, the persons who committed that thing, they used to stand in front of all the church congregation and the Church used to pray. Is is it the right thing to do, or is it necessary? I just want to know. Sure. Thanks, sir. If so, if I've understood uh, correctly, uh, once you're saying so, once the individual or uh, the couple have uh, repented from their ways, uh, is it necessary for uh, for them to acknowledge that it publicly in in the congregation? And should the pastor uh, mention their names and ask them to stand? Is that is that correct? Yes, pastor. Okay. All right. Um, 
फर्स्ट जेक सर फर्स्ट आशीष और कुछ से um yeah i just i just feel that um, you know uh, going by matthew 18 and uh, how we you know administer the correction and also you know based on the word of god of course we are assuming that they are believers right and in the church so then they will of course uh, value the word of god and uh, you know what we are saying and uh, and we are also giving them time to change right every time we go alone tell them this is wrong according to the word of god you need to change and then uh, and then hopefully they'll repent or the other thing is they are continuing in sin then the second time is you go with the elders of the church and you you know you talk to them of course it's a very sensitive thing but you talk to them um like i would say that it's not necessary to you know kind of uh, bring it and announce in front of the whole church um because every time we go to them we can tell them the consequence you know if you continue in this manner then you uh, you will be put out of fellowship you know you cannot continue to have fellowship because it's a serious thing right so you are you are living in a, a kind of a relationship brazenly and uh, that is not what the word of god advocates so if you're continuing in this uh, to tell them the consequence the consequence is of course personally you will be you know you're you're destroying your lives but then also you know we we cannot continue in fellowship in this manner um, so it's as serious as that so uh, we just need to tell them the consequence of it um, and then of course if they still continue if they are in open rebellion and they're coming to you know you can at the as a, as a last resort you, uh, you know you tell them you know you cannot continue in fellowship uh, uh, you know in church so i cannot continue with the membership so it's it's reached that stage and um, so you tell them so i i i think it's not necessary to announce in church publicly and tell them and so uh, let's say we put them out of fellowship and then they repent and change then uh, we you know take them back um of course the situation is different if the person is in you know a leadership position let's say you know a life group leader or you know serving in some of the ministry teams and you know this is happening then um then of course people will need to be informed why you know we're doing this right uh, pastor if you want like to add yeah um yeah i think you you know both jean and uh, yourself um check have uh, addressed it correctly i think there's yeah just to sum it up it, you know there's the sensitivity to individuals but then there is also the the truth and like you know you we have to bring grace and truth to bear on the situation the word of god and uh, uh you know we cannot overlook the sin on basis of grace but at the same time you don't want to hurt the individuals in the process so i think both you know if what what all of you have said paul and yeah it's all good all right okay i think uh we uh just reached our time uh we're out of time right now uh, abhishek we will uh is it okay if we uh, take your question for the following week uh mm. that Okay, I think uh, we'll do that. Um, uh, so, Pastor, is that okay? We take the question yeah. from Paul. Yeah, let's uh, wrap up in prayer and. Uh... Awesome. Sure. Yeah, uh, let's all uh, let's all pray and bring the session to an end. Uh, Father, we thank you uh, for this time, Lord, of learning that we have. We thank you for this privilege, uh, Father, that we have this opportunity to come and learn from your word, uh, from your wisdom and your insights, Father. I pray that you will continue to uh, pour out your wisdom and your knowledge, even as we continue to study from your word, Lord. We submit the rest of the day into your hands. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Thank you, everybody. Have a nice day. Good day. Bye.